You know, just, I, I spent the last year co-authoring a book about clean energy, about how we develop a clean energy future. We call it Apollo's fire because we want to harken back to the idea that the original Apollo project. <clears throat> and looking at this thing, I became more and more convinced that you, that you have to develop new technologies to help solve this problem. It's just absolutely fundamentally key to solving this problem. There's just no way we can do enough trees or algae or you just got to have new technology. If that's true, um, and I asked this Mr. Blanchard, Mr. George, Mr. Boucher, um, doesn't it make sense if we're going to have offsets to focus on those that Mr. Rom suggested in this gold standard that direct this offset investment towards investments that will spur new, new technological growth, both in efficiency and in renewable energy sources, as opposed to sequestration or land use or or some areas, doesn't is, isn't that a higher value? And if so, what does the consumer know about that between the various um, um, uh, offset markets that are out there? Well, could I could I answer that briefly? When when you don't put a ton of carbon dioxide into the Earth's atmosphere, you don't <clears throat> cause any further harm to the planet. When you, when you hire a tree or a green plant in the ocean to take that ton of carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and turn it into those living plants, that living ecosystem, it's no longer harming the planet, but it's also healing the harm done to date and providing an ongoing healing form. And, and the re what we're concerned about with global warm with carbon dioxide in the air, is the harm it does to the living planet, right? It's the harm that it's doing to those to the ecosystems of the planet. So why not employ those ecosystems, which are in a dramatically reduced state? Why not bring them back? In Hungary, it used to be 17 percent forest. It's, it used to be 70 percent forest. It's now 17 percent. We're going to plant a quarter of a million acres of new forest in Hungary that goes into the national park system there that will be very heavily protected. It will be a long-term, enormous benefit to, the, to that ecosystem there. And the same thing goes in, in restoring the ocean. If, if we don't restore the harm already done by, by climate change, by carbon dioxide, you know, what good does it do to, to do no further harm? Right? We have to also heal the harm done. I just want to know one concern I have is what really results in geological storage. You've you got to have geological storage to make this. Trees fall over and die, and they decompose, and then their CO2 is emitted. And I suppose what you're telling me is that, that these credits you're buying is to keep these forests in perpetuity, so you just replace the, the tree that's fallen down and decomposed? Is that the idea? Well, forests are self-sustaining green machines that keep themselves going in perpetuity. The fossil fuel age is only about 200 years old at best, you know, really 100 years old in, in, in high gear. It, you know, by all um, accounts, it's only going to last a few hundred years longer. In the ocean, it's very easy to see carbon repositioned in the deep ocean for periods of millennia. Right? It I, may be back 2,000 years from now, but the fossil fuel age will be long gone. I want to ask about the uh, European the certified emissions reductions. As I understand, these are certificates in Europe. Do, yeah, your, do your markets, and I ask all of you, do, you, do you use those? Do you invest in them? And are they a prototype that we should consider in the United States you as have a to certificate? I'm, I'm going to ask all the okay. panel, not just from yep. Mr. George, anyone that wants to answer the question, go ahead. But Anyone? Mr. Ensley, the, the certified emission reductions are actually units that are created under the Kyoto Protocol. The European Union has a trading system set, set up that recognizes those credits. Um, it, it, I think certainly within the framework that the Kyoto Protocol has established, these are, these are credible carbon offset instruments. Uh, the questions have been raised about projects here and there, but overall it's a pretty credible mechanism. So, Mr. Blatchard, in your, in your company, do you sell those? Do you meet those certification standards? Well, no, because they're really for sale within the Kyoto Protocol. Uh, they're not really for sale in the voluntary market. There are VERs, voluntary emission reductions, that are, again, it's just a denomination of the credit, that are held to a very similar standard, uh, typically from developing countries. Um, we sell projects that are in the United States. Uh, and so we don't, we don't right now sell anything that would qualify there. I think there are standards in development, though, including the gold standard uh, that uh, Mr. Rahm was talking about before, um, that incorporate most, if not all, of the same 
uh, the same attributes that those CERs and VERs. So would you meet their standards uh, in a domestic context? Well, today it's not so much a question of whether we meet the standards, sir. It's more a question of whether the projects do. I actually went to the Gold Standard uh, Project database this morning, uh, anticipating some of this conversation, and there is only one project listed in that database that's operational today. Thank you. You know, you know, you have to understand that carbon credits are, are you, you should think about them in terms of bottles of wine. They have a vintage year and a label. And there is quite a large variety of different carbon credit markets out there. It is important each year. The vintage is important because we retire the credits on an annual basis. But the label is also critically important. So there, there, is, a, there is a plethora of uh, different labels of carbon credits emerging in the markets around the world, especially those markets where there is mandatory requirements. Gentlemen's time has expired. The uh, Chair recognizes the uh Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A um, couple of quick questions. Mr. Brokoff, I really want to come to you. You said you all were developing some accounting standards on the carbon offsets. So let me ask you this. Do you think that it is possible or that we should even try to develop Federal guidelines for voluntary carbon offsets, um, develop some guidelines that would clarify the voluntary costs? Uh, carbon offset industry and still preserve it as a, a voluntary industry. I mean, what, is your, what is your take on that? Or should we just leave it alone and avoid full-scale government regulation? I think it is possible for the Federal Government to provide some oversight and guidance, for example, in recommending uh, best practice uh, accounting protocols for the quantification of carbon offsets, uh, also perhaps in terms of certifying verifiers or certifying uh, registries that could serve this market without directly providing, uh, you know, con controlling the market or providing direct regulation. George? Well, the, you know, the, um, the carbon, the, the it's, it's all about money, right? If you buy carbon credits from a, a hybrid car vehicle producer, right, you buy a hybrid vehicle, you know, you pay about $5,000 extra for the hybrid vehicle over the gas version of that vehicle. It's all, it, it doesn't emit about two tons of carbon dioxide per year, but you paid $5,000 up front for it. If you invest in, if you buy carbon credits from trees and ocean projects around the world, you might pay about five bucks a ton for it. So not everybody can afford to go out and buy a brand new automobile with a $5,000 premium on it to reduce their carbon footprint by two tons a year. But everybody can afford to plant enough trees to get two tons a year. That's $10 a year. Everybody can afford to do that. A family of four in the United States has a carbon footprint of about 20 tons per year. At $5 a ton that tree planting projects can s are selling in that, that's about 100 bucks a year. That's $8.33 a month. So, you know, buy Mother Nature one cheap cocktail a month and you've taken care of her. Now, people who don't like offset projects, who want the high priced, you know, engineered solutions, are very opposed to this. But it's part of the solution and it also heals the harm that's done. So, and everybody can afford it. So, the, the voluntary market to choose these affordable, low-end solutions, the green solutions, is a very practical step. Well, I can tell you, Mr. George, if you are talking about hiring a tree, I think some of my foresters in Tennessee have a lot of trees they would like to um, hire out for you. Now, you are a for-profit company. Yeah, we are a for-profit public company. And you are looking to increase and stabilize your income stream. So do you think that the entrepreneurial spirit that we have in the country, the entrepreneurial spirit we are seeing around this industry, coupling that with an increased environmental awareness by American families and certainly by organizations and companies could drive the voluntary carbon offset market without burdensome? Yeah, 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 yeah I, I do, and we're some of an anomaly. You know, we're a, we're an American uh, entrepreneurial activity. We do all of our science here, and virtually 100 percent of our money comes from Zurich and London. <laughs> so, so you would leave government out of voluntary carbon offset market, and Mr. Brokoff says it, he thinks that it would be helpful. In uh, I'd love to have the government aboard on this voluntary market. I think it would help. I think people would have more confidence if there was some government oversight. You know, it would make life a lot easier. Uh, I mean, you know, heaven help me, you know, sometimes the bureaucracy is a bit burdensome. 
you know, but uh, it's, a, it's a positive thing, generally. Okay. Mr. Belcher, I know I'm going to yeah. run out of time, and I may submit my question to you. I'm curious about <clears throat> selling electricity through renewable energy, and I had asked you about, um, you know, if you received any government subsidies, and I know that the wind turbine project with uh, the Rosebud, Sue Rosebud, did receive some, and um, I know there was a DOE grant and I think a rural mm -hmm. development grant in that. So I've got some questions surrounding that. If you will, sir, I will submit those to you in writing for an answer, in writing from Native Energy. And uh, I think it's important for us to look at whether or not this is something that is sustainable and something that is going to be profitable and du doable and duplicative. Mm -hmm. so that it can be replicated. Um, so let's, um, I, I do have some questions about that. I will go ahead and yield back my time and then submit that in writing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Right. General lady's time has expired and we ask the panel to respond in writing to the general questions when she propounds them. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Missouri, uh, Mr. Cleaver. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, I think, Mr. George, you, you partially uh, answered this uh, question. Uh, the, the, the several estimates uh, suggest that the average American family uh, generates 20 tons uh, uh, carbon dioxide annually, and I think f about 4.5 for the rest of the world. The rest of the world is much lower. Yes. The, the, um, and, and then you, you, we, you talked about the, um, the fact that to, to, to buy a, an automobile that actually generates less uh, greenhouse gas uh, contributors will cost more money. Do you think that, that the reverse ought to be the case in the United States? In other words, uh, that you, you essentially pay more money if you buy a large em emitter, uh, if you want a big SUV, you pay more for that than you would pay for buying a hybrid. Uh, because right now, it's, you know, if you're trying to be environmentally sensitive, you pay it costs you more money. Uh, and so, just like cigarettes cost more money, uh, if you want to, you know, uh, if you want to go ahead and smoke in spite of the hazards and, and the way you contribute to the rising health costs in the country, okay, it's going to cost you $4 a, a pack. Um, am, am, is it clear enough? Um, yeah, I, I think that, I think, sure, if you, uh, a larger, larger footprint uh, items, you know, ought to pay their way, right? Um, and, and hopefully that, you know, recently we had a, uh, a, an owner of a large mega yacht, you know, it's kind of like the most extreme example of an object that somebody might own. And they, they contacted us because they were tied up next to our research ship that's down in Florida picking up scientific gear. You know, and it's just the most beautiful thing you've ever seen, you know, polished to a high polish. And the owner of the yacht, I was drinking coffee on, on our research ship one morning, and he was drinking coffee on his, and, and we were literally tied together. So we, were, we could almost touch. And he said, well, you know, tell me about all this carbon sequestration stuff. And I said, well, you tell me about your boat. How many gallons of fuel do you burn? And he told me how many gallons of fuel he burned. And I said, well, let's do the calculation. And I, I just did the back of the envelope calculation. I said, well, you know, you know, if you wanted to reduce the carbon footprint of this 140-foot mega yacht, bigger than our research ship, right, you'd have to pay about $2,000 a year to make that zero by planting trees. And he said, I just paid more than that to varnish the back rail on this boat. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and, he, and he says, let me get my checkbook out. All right, and he and he did. So you know, uh, you know, if if it's affordable, people will do this, right? But if you had to, if you have a twenty-ton footprint, and you got to pay, you know, what effectively twenty-five hundred dollars a ton, right? That's Toyota's charge for your footprint. Well, that's a big number, right? You got to shell out fifty grand to go carbon neutral. Well, you nobody, some people can afford that. I can't. <laughs> Right? Most people can't afford that. But I can afford 100 bucks a year right? to do the right thing for the greener solution. And that's why the British Stern report that talked about the need to spend 3 to $4 trillion immediately 
to solve to address this problem of climate change is such a staggering number. It's because they use that engineering metric to come by that number. If you use the green metric to come by the cost of, of making a really meaningful uh, part of the solution, part of the solution to climate change, we can afford it easily. Right? It's very low cost. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And it's immediately available. Right? We can do it today. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from California, Mr. McNerney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the United States has historically been the biggest contributor to uh, greenhouse trapping gases in the atmosphere, but that is changing now, and we have some other competitors out there that are going to do uh, at least as good a job as we are, as we are of, of uh, contributing those gases. And our think, I think one of our biggest challenges is to work with those other countries to find ways to cooperate toward reducing our footprint and their footprint at the same time. Uh, what lessons uh, can we learn from the voluntary uh, system out there uh, and maybe moving toward mandatory systems that, that could be applied that we could uh, sort of uh, <coughs> um, encourage other countries to follow that, that may be large contributors uh, in the future? And I will take an answer from anyone. Well, I guess I would, uh, I would just point out that under the Kyoto Protocol, part of the idea of having the, uh, the offset project types be based in emerging markets is precisely to try to stimulate the development of renewable energy uh, and other clean, clean development uh, in those markets because as they mature and as there is increasing demand for energy in those markets, it would be nice if it was uh, energy that was renewable instead of energy that was based on fossil fuels. So I think that is one very obvious way. We can encourage the development of, uh, of projects in those countries. You know, in every, every place in Europe you go, you see an advertisement on the wall put up by some public agency or some organization giving people an education on how to reduce their carbon footprint. Right? Everywhere you go in Europe, you find well, that. I am not and talking about Europe. I am talking no, about Asia. No, but that has produced <coughs> this fantastic effect of stimulating thinking. And the Kyoto Accord has been a fantastic success story because its job was to stimulate people to try to think our way, invent our way out of this, out of this crisis. And we are and we're doing it. But it just seems that market-based approach would be the most effective. And uh, if we can produce laws that will be useful in encouraging Asia, in particular, to move forward in this um, it would be good to have that input from the, from the market, from you guys. Two, two and a half months ago, I was in China meeting with the Chi several different Chinese government organizations. I was given tours around China of the tree planting that is going on there. And I am a, I'm a tree planter, so I know a, tree, a new tree when I see one. I saw 25 years of extensive tree planting going on there in China. China and Costa Rica are the only two countries on the planet that are ahead of the game on forestry, planting more trees than they are clearing every year. The, the Chinese are enormously dedicated to climate change solutions. They are working on it. They are, are very insular. They don't really talk about it. I was amazed when I met with foresters there who, who were asking me about how to create carbon credits. I met with one group and I, and I, they, about wind power. Some of these guys here are wind power guys. And they said, they said well, can you earn a carbon credit with wind power? <laughs> and I said, yeah. And, they, and I said, well, and, and are you going to put wind power in? They said, yeah, we are looking at uh, 250 megawatts right away you know, in one little area. And they said, can we earn a carbon credit for that? And I said, well, of course. <laughs> you know? so, so those countries are, in fact, actually very wor working on it. On, on the other side of the equation, you know, they are burning the nastiest coal on Earth. All the, you know, the mercury that we worry about in tuna in the, in the open ocean, you know, where does it come from? It all comes from Chinese coal pollution, right? That's why the mercury suddenly appeared, you know, in the in the fish world, right? Is that that mercury has come from those Chinese coal plants? So we got to shut those things down with other means and for other purposes other than strictly climate change, right? It, I mean, to get to your question, I think the rate of development in countries like China, and India, is going to have to be met with intelligent. Uh, cap and trade regulations that they're going to have to sign on to to spur clean energy technologies and and carbon sequestration. I think that 
they're not going to act. I'm sure if you've talked to them, you know they're not going to act until we take some action ourselves. Um, so I think the first step is is the development of a U.S. mandatory regime, uh, and then working with them as quickly as possible to get them to develop a mandatory regime. You know, in China, every man, woman, and child by law in China has to plant five trees per year. That's six billion trees per year go in the ground. And everywhere in China where you go, if you're an old tree planter like me, you see that that's going on. I see those trees are in the ground growing. So they're, it's a, it's, it's, they're working on it. Okay, thank you. Time has expired. <coughs> the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Walton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that. I'm, I'm intrigued, Mr. George, by your comment about uh, what great foresters the Chinese are <coughs> because there was an extensive uh, series of articles, or at least uh, one article in the Washington Post recently about all the illegal logging that's going on in China. And despite their rules, they're in, in, incapable of enforcing them in the provinces. So I'm glad that, that your view on that is, uh, is a different picture than what we read in the Post because that was pretty devastating in terms of the harvest levels there, Russia, Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, other tropical countries where the rainforests are being wiped out so they can ship the wood to China, so they can process it into furniture, so we can buy it here and feel good about uh, ourselves, I guess. Um, so I'm glad to hear they're, they're doing more in China than what we, what we read. I, uh, uh, it, it strikes me, too, that in China we're told that they're putting two 500 megawatt coal-burning power plants online I think it's every week this year. Mr. Rahm, is that? Yeah, no, it's staggering. It's, 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 uh, uh, it's like the equivalent of a, a new California uh, every year. And, and isn't that why somehow, by hook or crook, we need to get China and India and the other big carbon emitters in with us globally to address this issue? China did, the Premier of China did commit to about two months ago when he was visiting with the uh, Premier of Japan, Prime Minister of Japan, that China would be a full compliant member of Kyoto beginning uh, in the second period following 2012. Well, I'm, I'm so they ha yes, they have made that. Yeah, I, I'm, uh, Mr. George, I'm glad yeah. to hear the commitments. Um, I've seen it in trade issues too, where they've made a lot of commitments, and gosh, some of them aren't always followed. And I, I actually supported putting China in WTO so we'd have international compliance. And all, but uh, so I'm glad if, if if he's making that that level of commitment. Those coal plants are the ugliest thing on earth. I've been by a bunch of them. You know? Well, Mr. Rahm, let, let's continue on with with this because I know they're also committed to do other energy sources. But that uh, are they using the, the latest technologies in these new plants they're putting in line? Do you know? No, I mean uh, they're not, and they're they're using. I think by and large they're using pulverized coal, which may be very difficult to retrofit. Uh, to capture carbon. I, I think the, the top priorities for the United States should be to develop a mandatory regime ourselves just so we have credibility to go to other countries. If you've talked to people from China and India, you know that they scoff at the notion that, that the poor countries shouldn't, that the rich countries can't act until the poor countries act, but they're, right. they're going to have to act right after we act. So I think we need to do something for our own uh, credibility. I also think we have to figure out how to do this technology transfer because they're going to build right. coal plants. Right. And so we have to figure out how to make sure that they build coal plants that can capture carbon and work with them to figure out how, uh, how and where to sequester it. Are, 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 who among you is, is sort of up on sequestration? Because when some of us were in Europe uh, earlier this summer, we went out to a coal plant where they were working on a sequestration facility, although we didn't end up getting to see that facility itself. But there, my understanding is that that's still uh, pretty experimental in trying to actually sequester carbon. Yeah, I mean, we, we haven't, uh, the, the, um, uh, the Bush administration has future gen, which right. I think is kind of a very slow process that won't demonstrate uh, the successful uh, integration of everything for 10 years for sequestration. I, I think, frankly, the top, a top priority of the federal government should be to A, start doing demonstration projects, which I think are occurring, but B, someone's got to go out and identify and certify geologic repositories. Right. That, in fact, that was an issue that came up in Europe. They're, they actually have on their books in some countries, I'm told, anti-pollution laws, and they treat carbon as a pollutant. 
And so they've got to modify their law because you can't put pollutants in the ground legally. So once they figure out how to sequester carbon, they've got to fix their law because otherwise you're injecting a, a pollutant into the ground in violation of their law. The, the, the other issue that came up in our discussions was not only how you resolve that, which could be done, but how do you, are there other liability issues that could occur? Does carbon injected into the ground force something else out that you become liable for? Does it escape at some point? And therefore, how do you deal with the escape gas if it does? Are, are you familiar with any of Sure. Well, I, the, the answer to the question is these are all good questions, and no one has addressed them formally in any consensus-based process. And I would certainly urge, again, uh, you know, the, the committee or the, the government to, to pursue that aggressively, because carbon dioxide is an invisible gas. You know, right. it, is, it is exceedingly difficult to detect. Right. And in a worst case scenario, a massive leak of carbon dioxide would, would cause harm. Well, in fact, there's that lake I just saw. Lake where, in, uh, in Africa, absolutely, yeah, yes. Where, where if the bubble pops, it could kill everybody around there because it would inundate them with carbon. And So people may not be thrilled to have a large carbon dioxide repository in, in their backyard, and I think setting up a certification process, you know, I, I, is a very urgent thing. I mean, look, it's taken, how, how long have we been trying to certify one nuclear repository? Yeah. Uh, I don't think it'll be as hard to certify a carbon repository, but we're going to need dozens of them. Maybe so, we can put them both there and yuck them out. And <laughs> My time's expired, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Those are issues. Thank you, gentlemen. You know, yuck them out won't be storing nuclear waste in the near future, so maybe it's uh, something that could be purpose. So here's what I'd like. Uh, I'd like each of the witnesses to give us their one minute summation, what it is that you want the select committee to remember from your testimony uh, as we move forward over the course of the next several months and a couple of years uh, looking at the, this issue. Uh, let's begin with you, Mr. Boucher, if you would give us your final one minute. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, Despite our position in the voluntary carbon offsets market, I think the one thing we would like to see Congress do as soon as possible is a well-designed mandatory cap-and-trade put in place. And I think the evolving voluntary market will continue to support that. It will help folks get from whatever level is established by mandates to net zero for those who want to get there. The other uh, point I wanted to make is that in designing that, it has to be very well designed so that the mandatory cap and trade does not strip away the benefits of renewable energy projects in particular in the same way that has occurred um, on SO2 cap and trading, in that basically any reduction from a renewable project goes to the benefit of the utility. The utility then has additional allowances it can sell. Uh, there has to be direct allocation of rights to the renewable energy projects to preserve the voluntary market in that future cap-and-trade regime. Uh, there's been discussion about uh, voluntary, uh, the gold standard, and I'd just like to note for the record that we are working with gold standard to bring forward the first gold standard certified project in the U.S., and we expect that to happen later this year. It will be the Owl Feather Warbonnet project on the Rosebud Reservation. Thank you. Gentleman, gentleman's time has expired. Mr. George. Well, I think you should, uh, you know, pay attention to the fact that there are, uh, you know, sides forming on this issue. There are people who are in favor of uh, offsets from biological forestry and other sources, and there are people who are sort of in the engineering world. And there's a lot of territoriality being expressed. And we're not going to solve this problem if we sort of let this thing uh, uh, disintegrate into factions, competing factions. We really need all of the solutions on the table. You know, there simply isn't time to engage in a, in a sort of a prohibitions of certain things because uh, we don't know enough yet when we're trying to prohibit the ability to develop that knowledge. You know, we simply need to, to look at all of the po possible solutions as fast as we can and find the ones that work. And I think it will sort itself out. Uh, Mr. Blatchford. Uh, well, I would, uh, I would echo Mr. Boucher's call for um, a well-designed mandatory cap-and-trade or combination of cap-and-trade with other forms of uh, regulation at the highest levels. Uh, I would also, again, uh, just repeat my call earlier for, uh, for some level of government 
uh, uh, involvement in forming uh, better and more uh, persistent standards for offset project quality. I think it's, it's just essential for this market to really thrive and for these reductions to happen for there to be clear rules of the road. Uh, my company, it, it's wonderful that we were invited here today, but the reality is we're six people sitting in a single room in San Francisco trying to make a difference, trying to play by the rules. We've got to have some rules so we, we know how to play by them. Uh, we're doing the best we can, but uh, we really could use some help. Thank you, Ms. Mr. Butcher, very much. Mr. Rome. Yeah, I mean, I think I agree with the need for a mandatory regime. Obviously, it's going to take a while to set up the rules of the road there. I think it is important for Congress to not wait until you have passed the mandatory regime to start the process of developing protocols for what are verifiable emissions reductions, because that could take two or three, four or five years. So if we have to wait till let's say, 2009 to start that process, we may not get those rules uh, for three or four or five years after that. So if there's any way you can do some things in parallel uh, over the next two <coughs> years, uh, I just think that would be immensely valuable. Uh, I will make one final point. We do need to figure out a way to preserve tropical forests. They are the lungs of the planet, and, and the deforestation that is occurring uh, is, is catastrophic from a climate and many other points of view. Uh, I think you have to do that at a nationwide level. That is what the U.N. is moving towards rather than a project-based level. So um, I don't want to leave people with the impression that the, the solution to our fossil fuel problem can be solved just by planting trees. Um, trees could be a, you know, part of the solution, but the big part of the solution is, is energy efficiency efficiency and renewable energy and, and perhaps carbon capture and storage from coal plants. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Brokoff. I agree with uh, Dr. Rahm. If, if there is a choice between uh, developing a mandatory program and overseeing the voluntary market, I think the choice, the focus should be on a mandatory market. However, in the interim period, there is a role for the voluntary market to play to provide a learning uh, experience uh, in developing these kinds of protocols. I think if the Federal Government does choose to provide some oversight of this market, it should build off of the standards and programs that have been developed to date and can either take the form of endorsing one of these programs or providing some explicit guidance on the quantification protocols, the verification, accreditation of verifiers, and the establishment or certification of registries so that we have a consistent carbon offset commodity that people can trust. That is what the market needs. Uh, thank you, Mr. Brokoff, and we thank all of you. Um, what uh, what I am going to do on behalf of the Select Committee is write to the Federal Trade Commission uh, and uh, ask them uh, to begin a public process to look at this area of voluntary offsets. Uh, there already is something in place that the FTC uses in environmental programs. I think that uh, clearly under Section 5 of the Federal Trade Commission Act, there is a place uh, here for that agency to look to ensure that consumers uh, get what they uh, have as an expectation uh, as they uh, spend money. And, um, and, uh, and I hope that uh, Chairwoman Harris uh, at the Federal Trade Commission will respond uh, to that uh, request. Um, this hearing has been very helpful to us. Uh, it is, uh, I think, the first hearing that has been held on this uh, subject, and I think that it's something that is very illuminating, can be very helpful in the long run, uh, as long as there are standards uh, which are transparent and understood by uh, the marketplace. So, with that and the thanks of the Select Committee, this hearing is adjourned. Yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't <laughs> get around to your email, but I, I, I had If to you could all turn off your microphones, it might was, help all of you to right not. Uh, <laughs> well, I was late, but fortunately, I get it, ended up on the same elevator as, as Marky. Uh, uh,